to you about some very interesting events that have recently transpired that have profound prophetic implications. We're going to take a few moments and look at a unique video that was just posted on the internet. It's a special message from Pope Francis to a convocation uh, filled with charismatic and Pentecostal ministers. It's an appeal for unity, for them to uh, unite or to join again with the Catholic Church. Uh, it's an invitation for them to be one. And I think this is very significant. Uh, we won't be able to show the whole video. We will post it at the Amazing Facts website if you'd like to view it in its entirety. But I'd like to go through and look at it and highlight some points that I want to bring to your attention. Why don't we go ahead and we'll roll that now. I believe that God has brought me here to this year's Ministers' Conference in the spirit of Elijah. Let me explain. If you look carefully, the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers. Well, let's pause the tape right there. Now, in a moment, we're going to be hearing a personal message from Pope Francis. But to me, even more interesting is the question about who is this Bishop Tony Palmer? A very dashing individual that seems to have a personal relationship with the Pope and is being sent as an envoy of the Pope. He sort of is a mediator in that he's not technically a Catholic, he's an Anglican. He has a, his own ministry that is uh, specifically focused on bringing unity to the churches. And he's not just going to this conference of the uh, Charismatics, but he's making the rounds in every way he can to bring the different churches together. He does a masterful job as framing himself as the prophet Elijah with a message to bring the children back to the fathers and the fathers to the children. A message of unity, playing down doctrinal differences. You can listen and see what you think. And to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons, to prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that prophecy always has a double fulfillment. And we know that Elijah will come before the second coming as well. And I've understood that the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation to return hearts to each other. This is very important. We know that the first thousand years there was one church, it was called the Catholic Church, and the word Catholic means universal, it doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means, you, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. Don't want to make too much out of it because he's right. The word Catholic does technically mean universal. But what you're seeing here is in very careful, deliberate increments, the distinctions between Catholics and Protestants are being broken down. Let's go ahead and keep playing. Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then, from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. You see what's happening here, friends, is uh, he's calling it Luther's protest. Instead of it being the Protestant movement or the Protestant Reformation, it's sort of being uh, stated as it's really the rebellion of the protest of one disgruntled priest. But this was really a movement based upon a lot of theological differences. Let's go ahead and play. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. I don't know if you caught that, friends, but that's very significant and troubling. Diversity is wonderful, it's divine, but division is diabolical. See, that's just patently not true. Not all division is diabolical. The Bible tells us that the Word of God divides. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus said, I have not come to send peace, but to send a sword. Uh, Paul tells us that we must come out and be separate. And when the apostles in their day took a stand for the truth, there was a division that took place between themselves and the big church. And so uh, in the last days, when we take a stand for the truth, we're going to be called not only divisive, we're going to be called diabolical. 
It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. He said, it's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. Well, I don't know if I mentioned earlier that uh, Bishop Tony Palmer is also a charismatic. He speaks in tongues. He supports that. And the charismatic movement is um, a very interesting movement in that it really is a form of spiritualism that has come into the Christian church. Matter of fact, more emphasis is put on the spirit than on doctrine. You know, one more thing I thought I should insert at this point as we're talking about who is this Tony Palmer. Um, he told the crowd, when my wife saw that she could be a Catholic and a charismatic and evangelical and Pentecostal and it was absolutely accepted in the Catholic Church, see, she, she said she wanted to reconnect her roots with the Catholic culture, so she did. So there's no mistaking what his goal is. He said his wife believed she could be all of these things and reconnect to the Catholic culture. This is going to be the goal, that everybody comes together in the Christian world within or recognizing the Catholic culture. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. Don't worry about doctrine here. We'll sort out all the doctrines when we get to heaven. Let's just love each other here. But doctrine is very important. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, the people were amazed at his doctrine. So what are we going to do? Eliminate the Sermon on the Mount because we're just supposed to love each other. We'll sort out the doctrines later. This is going to be the mantra that you're going to hear over and over again. Let's play. Therefore, Christian unity is the basis of our credibility because Jesus said until they won, they will not believe. The world will not believe, as they should, until we are one. Division destroys our credibility. It is fear that keeps us separated because fear is false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Because most of your fear is based on propaganda. So what we're really hearing here is that the Protestant Reformation teachings are propaganda that incites fear. And so it's bad. Don't worry about this propaganda. Okay, keep going. Now why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. Little correction. It wasn't just Luther that believed this. It was tens of thousands of dedicated Christians that wanted to get back to the Bible. Huss believed it, Wycliffe believed it, Tyndale believed it, all the great reformers believed it. It wasn't just Luther. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. Because in the Protestant Church, we had a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue. Because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace, alone, in faith, in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God 
and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Well, this may sound like it was just uh, the protest of Luther. Luther didn't protest against one thing. He nailed 95 different points of protest on the doors of the Wittenberg church. This is addressing one of the issues. It's not the only issue. And you'll notice that in the wording, in the language that's used in this agreement, it's very convoluted and cagey because the Catholics were looking for a wording where they would not need to renounce what they formally believed or say there was anything wrong with their doctrines. And so uh, don't have time to go into that, but it's not exactly what it appears on the surface. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. Let's pause. So he's really throwing down the gauntlet. He's saying Lutherans have signed an agreement that the protest is over and the Methodists signed this agreement. Now we're looking for the uh, evangelicals and the Pentecostals to sign this agreement. And so we can all be one again. The Protestant Reformation, not necessary. Uh, we're all in harmony now. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? I, I think it's uh, easy for us to see where this is going. Uh, the distinction between Protestants and Catholics is uh, being chipped away at. Uh, this is a movement towards a one world religion. This is exactly what prophecy says has to happen before Jesus comes back. The world's being shaken right now. There'll only be two groups when Christ comes back. One group will have the seal of God, the other group will have the mark of the beast. Obviously, if there are 33,000 different Christian denominations, something has to happen to polarize these two groups into those, one of those two camps. This is where you're seeing prophecy being fulfilled right now, friends. These are the kind of statements, these are the kinds of appeals that will be made to bring everybody together into one unified body where we downplay doctrine, downplay the Bible. Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. But we are reformed. We are Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. Do we preach the same gospel? Uh, unless there's been some radical changes since 1999 that I don't know about. Just to give you a few examples of some of the distinctive differences that brought about the Protestant Reformation. The Bible teaches we're not supposed to bow down to statues. That's like one of the Ten Commandments. And the law of God is part of the gospel. Roman Catholic Church says we should bow down to statues. The Bible teaches that all have sinned except Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary was sinless. The Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. The Roman Catholic Church says that Mary is a co-mediator. The Bible teaches that Christ offered his sacrifice once on the cross for all Hebrews 7.27. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the priest sacrifices Christ on the altar whenever he conducts Mass. The Bible teaches that all Christians are saints and priests, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. The Roman Catholic Church says that saints and priests are a special caste within the Christian community. The Bible teaches that all Christians should know that they have eternal life, 1 John 5.13. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that all Christians cannot and should not know that they have eternal life. The Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader father. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that we may call priests and the Pope father. And Bishop Tony Palmer is also called Father Tony. The Bible teaches not to pray in vain repetition. Yet the Roman Catholic Church says you can say Hail Mary and Our Father in vain repetition. 
The Bible teaches to confess your sins to God only, that only God can forgive sins. Roman Catholic Church says you must confess your sins to the priest. The Bible teaches before baptism, a person should be taught the gospel and the commandments of Christ, believe and repent. The Roman Catholic Church teaches little infants can be baptized, or if they die before, they'll be consigned to hell. The teachings regarding purgatory, limbo, prayers to the dead are nowhere in Scripture, but they are relics of paganism. Now, there's great differences theologically between what the Protestants died for. They shed their blood for these principles of truth and what the Catholic and some of the Orthodox churches believe. And um, are we supposed to just say that truth doesn't matter anymore? Let's just love each other and that's how we're going to do evangelism? Evangelism must be based on truth. I can start preaching now, but we'll go back to the video. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over. So let me pray and then we'll start the video. I believe we will begin to see more and more people called out to go into the world and work among the churches in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Ministries of reconciliation. We need to throw as much resources and energy into the ministry of reconciliation as we do to the ministry of evangelization. Yes. Or are we building walls without foundations? I challenge you to find a bridge builder and back him or her. And I'd like to pray this prayer. And if you agree, you can say amen. This was a dying man's prayer. And when you know you're about to die, you certainly pray the most important prayers. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one as we are one. Glory to the Father. Amen. Okay, so part of that prayer of Jesus is, of course, that there would be oneness, that we could be united. But it also says in John chapter 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What it's going to be that will unite us is the Spirit of God, and the Spirit is the truth of God. The teachings, yes, those are the words. Again, John 16, same book, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. It's through the truth that we will have unity. It's through the doctrines. That's what brings people together. As we come closer together in the, uh, the theology of the Bible, the doctrines of truth, we come closer together in Christ because Jesus is the word made flesh. It's not as we come closer together in a feeling, a charisma, or a feeling of glory when we're baptized with the gift of tongues, that's not what brings the church together. That's not what real unity is. Very little reference to the Word of God and truth that sets us free in this. Now I think he's going to be playing his segment from the Pope. Dear brothers and sisters, excuse me, because I speak in Italian, but I am not speaking English. But uh, I will speak uh, no Italian, no English, but carefully. Now, first I think that the audience was thunderstruck when they saw 
the Pope come on the screen, that it actually is the Pope. This isn't a letter that's being read from the Pope. The Pope himself was specifically addressing this conference. Matter of fact, in the video message, he says, I've sent my friend, Tony Palmer, longtime friend with this message. Makes you wonder about the gravitas that this person has in the Vatican and if we're going to be seeing more of them in the future. And again, I want to reiterate that you know, the, the greatest part of Christ's true followers are not members of my church. I believe that there are genuine, sincere Christians in many different denominations. The Pope himself seems like a wonderful man. He reminds me of my grandfather. He looks just like my grandfather, really. But uh, I, I just want to make sure that everybody is not uh, tricked into thinking that this is all as homey and heartfelt as it's being made to appear. Uh, it is very possible that this message was somewhat scripted, that there were some notes that were reviewed, and then it was delivered extemporaneously, but there was an outline. And so this message, I think, is strategic. It might have been put on a uh, smartphone so that it appears to be just on the cuff. But let's keep watching. È una lingua più semplice e più autentica. E questa lingua del cuore ha un linguaggio e una grammatica speciale. La grammatica semplice, due regole. Ama Dio soprattutto e ama l'altro perché è tuo fratello e la tua sorella. E con queste due cose andiamo avanti. That is the statement that I hear as I do evangelism around the country and the world from other Christians. They say, we don't need the Ten Commandments. We don't need the Sabbath. It is true. The Ten Commandments are summarized in love for God, love for your neighbor. It's in the heart. But sometimes those statements are used to diminish the importance of specifically obeying God's commandments. And so while this is beautiful, and I do agree, we need to love the Lord and love our neighbor, that is not to dismiss the importance of specifically obeying the Ten Commandments. Let's go ahead. Io sono qui con mio fratello, mio vescovo fratello, Tony Palmer. Siamo amici da anni. E lui mi ha detto del vostro compagno, del vostro raduno. E Con piacere vi invio un saluto, un saluto gioioso e nostalgico. Gioioso perché eh, a me dà gioia che, che voi siete riuniti per lodare Gesù Cristo, l'unico Signore, eh, per eh, pregare al Padre e ricevere lo Spirito. E questo dà gioia perché si vede che il Signore lavora in tutto il mondo. È nostalgico perché... Ma succede come nei quartieri fra noi. No? Nei quartieri ci sono famiglie che si vogliono e famiglie che non si vogliono. Famiglie che si uniscono e famiglie che si separano. E noi siamo un po', mi permetto la parola, separati. So... He's basically saying that I greet you uh, with joy that you're gathered together to worship Jesus, but I'm also doing it with nostalgia or yearning as it would be translated in Italian, meaning I'm looking back to when we were one family. And we need to be one family again is the emphasis of the message. Separati perché i peccati ci hanno separati, i nostri peccati. Eh i malintesi nella storia, ma una lunga strada di peccato comunitario. Ma chi ha la colpa? Tutti abbiamo la colpa. Tutti siamo peccatori. Now, to me, this could be the uh, biggest understatement of the millennium, that all those 30 to 50 million people that were executed by the Catholic Church, this was a big misunderstanding and we don't know who's to blame. Well, I think it's because there was such a great divergence of theology that people would not recognize the superiority and the authority of the Church and I don't believe that they've changed their view on that point. Soltanto uno è giusto, il Signore. 
É, e olha a nostalgia que esta separação finisca e ci dia a comunhão, a minha nostalgia de aquele abraço de qua, nel qual parla a Sacra Scrittura, quando i fratelli di Giuseppe, affamati, sono andati a Egitto. And now here the Pope transitions into uh, a discourse that's really brilliant, talking about an embrace. And then he references the story of Joseph. And as he talks about the story of Joseph, Make sure that you understand the pictures that are coming up in the minds of the listeners. Uh, he is couching himself in the Catholic Church as Joseph. Joseph that was misunderstood and betrayed by his brothers. But his brothers began to starve for what only Joseph could give them. And that they came and ultimately bowed down to Joseph. And Joseph ended up being the ruler over them. They had been separated from their brother, but they came and embraced him in the end. Joseph embraced his brothers and he forgave his brothers for what they had done. So you decide as you're watching this little analogy, who's Joseph in the story? Per comprare, per poter mangiare. Ma andavano a comprare, avevano i soldi ma non potevano mangiare i soldi. E lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto. Hanno trovato il fratello. Tutti noi abbiamo dei soldi, i soldi della cultura, i soldi della nostra storia, di tante ricchezze culturali, anche religiose, tra, tradizioni diverse. Ma dobbiamo trovarci come fratelli e dobbiamo piangere insieme, come ha fatto Giuseppe, quel pianto che unisce pianto dell'amore. Io vi parlo come fratello eh? e vi parlo così semplicemente, con gioia e nostalgia. Facciamo crescere la nostalgia perché questo ci spingerà a trovarci, a abbracciarci e a lodare Gesù Cristo come unico Signore della storia. Vi ringrazio tanto per sentirmi. Vi ringrazio tanto per lasciarmi parlare la lingua del cuore. E vi chiedo anche un favore di pregare per me perché ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere. Io prego per voi, eh? lo farò, sì. ma io ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere e pregare al Signore perché ci unisca tutti. E avanti, siamo fratelli, ci diamo spiritualmente questo abbraccio e lasciamo che il Signore finisca l'opera che Lui ha incominciato. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è, è incominciato. E dice uno scrittore italiano, il Manzoni, famoso, dice questa frase in un romanzo, un, om, un uomo semplice del popolo dice questa frase Non ho trovato mai che il Signore abbia incominciato un miracolo senza finirlo bene. Lui finirà bene questo miracolo dell'unità. Well, friends, I, I tried to just let the, uh, the Pope speak uninterrupted because I thought it was important for you to get this, and I just really can't improve on it. There's an appeal. We embrace each other, a miracle of unity, that we blend our tears together, 
that we're all brothers. Um, this is really an appeal for uh, wayward Protestants to come home. By the way, when Joseph's brothers found Joseph, they ended up moving down to Egypt where Joseph was. Well, let him finish this off. Ti chiedo di benedirmi e io ti benedico. Ti fratello a fratello. Un abbraccio. Grazie. Thank you, sir. Come on, the man asked us to pray for him. Oh, Father. Now, uh, Pastor Kenneth Copeland comes up, who was a really a disciple of Oral Roberts himself. Uh, he's probably one of the most uh, premier charismatic uh, leaders in North America. Uh, also is a uh, pretty well-known prosperity preacher. But uh, interesting that uh, Pastor Ken Copeland and Pope Francis are both 77 years old, so they're, uh, they're coming from the, the same era. After the, this room full of, these aren't just laymen, these are leaders, these are ministers in the charismatic movement, they hear this message from the Pope, they rise to their feet, they applaud, they raise their hands in the air, and they think this is wonderful, seem to be embracing what the message is saying. Let's keep going. Father, we, we answer his request. And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in, in his, his, his heart for the unity of the body of Christ, we come together in the unity of our faith. Hallelujah. Just... It seems to me like he's agreeing with what the Pope said, that we're going to come together in the unity of our faith. Just wanted to make that point. Let's keep going. So, Father, we just, all of us now, according to Scripture, when we know not how to pray as we ought, we pray for him in the Spirit. We receive utterance in the Holy Ghost. We receive prayers of faith. We receive, sir, we receive words that are not our own. I don't see any example in the Bible of Jesus praying like this. Uh, Jesus said, you will speak with other tongues. He meant that the disciples would supernaturally be given the ability to speak languages they did not formally know or study for the purpose of preaching gospel to people that speak those languages. La Oh, hallelujah, 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 glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Father, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Tony, bring your phone in, come here. <clears throat> I want you to video a message back. 
come up here and let's do it this way so he can see this, this whole congregation. So now, it's actually a, a brilliant idea for um, um, marketing purposes that uh, Kenneth Copeland says, now we'd like to send a personal message back to the Vatican, back to the Pope. So I've got to go to the Vatican again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm ready, sir. My dear sir. Oh, sorry. My dear sir, thank you so from the bottom of our hearts. All of these leaders represent Literally tens of thousands of people that love you, that believe God with you, and in answer to your request, we have just prayed for you and with you, and we did so in the Spirit. And we believe we receive, according to the words of Jesus in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, that whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, Believe you receive them, and you shall have them. Our desire, sir, along with you, is in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Thank you, sir. We do bless you. We receive your blessing. It's very, very important to us. And we bless you with all of our hearts. We bless you with all of our souls. We bless you with all of our might. And we thank you, sir, we thank God for you. And so, all of us declare together, be blessed. Once again, all together, be blessed. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> I think you're going to have to come to the Vatican. I will. I'm available. Praise God. So. Bishop Tony was now inviting Kenneth Copeland to come to the Vatican. It'll be interesting to see if that uh, happens and how that plays out. Also, I, I don't think anyone could miss that they seem to embrace the message of the Pope for unity, say, we want your blessing and we want to bless you. God's will be done. Amen. Tony, thank you, sir. My, how you bless this place tonight. I love you. I love you. Give him a love, baby. Thank you. Amen. I told you you'd never forget it. Ha <laughs> ha yeah. Whoa. I tell you, I'm telling you right now, heaven is thrilled over this. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, you know, what, you know what's so thrilling to me? I, I mean, when we went into the ministry 47 years ago, this was impossible. Uh, that's right. He recognized how much things had changed since he first went into ministry because the Charismatics and the Pentecostals were very much Protestant, and they taught that the beast of Revelation back then was the Catholic Church. Things had radically changed, and you can see that in black and white in their teaching. Well, friends... I'd like to just close by reading something to you, and then I would like to suggest that you uh, do a little further study. This is from chapter 35 in the book, Great Controversy, and you tell me if you think the prophecy is being fulfilled. Romanism 
is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. In those countries where Catholicism is not in the ascendancy and the papists are taking a conciliatory course in order to gain influence, there's an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the Reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, we don't differ so widely on vital points as had been supposed, and so a little concession on our part will bring us into a better understanding with Rome. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience, which has been so dearly purchased. They taught their children to arbor popery, and they held to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed? Again, Great Controversy, page 563. Friends, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. In light of all these things that are happening, I know now why the Lord helped us get through three and a half years in producing one very important 90-minute DVD. This is a docudrama that Amazing Facts has just released. It's called Revelation, The Bride, the Beast, and Babylon. And if you watch this, you will understand why these issues are so significant and how close we are to the end of time. But I want to end.